This student is going to her class in one of Canada's biggest and most modern universities. Believe it or not. Hello and welcome to another edition of DNet, the Disability Network. I'm Susan Pettit. And I'm Joe Coughlin. Today we'll take a look at access, or lack of it, at colleges and universities. We'll also hear about some of the hidden expenses that can deplete the pocketbooks of people with disabilities. And if you use a wheelchair and you wish you had a four-wheel drive vehicle for winter driving, stay tuned. But first, here's this week's roundup of disability stories from across the country. Students with disabilities are becoming more outspoken at colleges and universities across Canada. That according to Kalinda Joseph of Ottawa, who is president of NEEDS, the National Educational Association of Disabled Students. Joseph says a NEEDS conference held recently in Halifax showed there is more and more input and activity by disabled students on Canadian campuses. The students really want to know and want to learn how they can improve things for themselves and, and that's what we got from them. Most of the workshops we had at the conference had very positive results and the students were really interested in learning what was happening across the country. And we had a lot of students networking with other students so that they could see how they were doing, how other students were doing things on different campuses and, and they were going to take that back home with them and that was uh, really positive, a positive attitude. And I don't think, there was no uh, complacency whatsoever among the students there. Joseph says one of the major challenges facing disabled students is improving the attitude of staff and administrators at Canadian colleges and universities. We'll hear more from Kalinda Joseph later in today's program. Disability Network has learned that the Ontario Human Rights Commission is considering a complaint against Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. A representative from the Commission, Peter Hoy, says a complaint can be laid in the next three or four weeks. The charges would stem from complaints made against Trent that the university is not meeting the needs of disabled students. The students charge that access is limited and that special needs are not being accommodated by the university. Among the complaints are overgrown stairways, handrails that end prematurely with one step to go, and overhangs that limit the access of the visually impaired. Trent students say the administration has not responded to their concerns in the past. A royal commission investigating new reproductive technologies has been told that some doctors are obsessed with perfect babies. The allegations were made by Pat Israel of the Disabled Women's Network, Don. Israel says some women who undergo prenatal testing are being coerced into abortions if the testing results show any abnormalities. She says it's a myth that genetic screening will eliminate disabilities. Most disabilities are not genetically based. Very few disabilities are genetically based, so they may get rid of some genetic disabilities, um, although some parents will choose to have the child. Um, the, the prenatal screening does not show how severe the disability be, so a spina bifida baby might have a little trouble walking or may have paralysis from the waist down, but even to me, that's not a major disability from what I've seen in the people I've known. So the myth is that these genetic tests will get rid of all disabilities, which it won't. You'll have car accidents, you'll have viruses, you'll have new things like you know, diseases like AIDS. So it's, um, we think science has solved everything, but um, when you think about it, it's kind of a horrific way of trying to produce a perfect baby. The Royal Commission is touring Canada to determine the extent to which new reproductive technologies should be regulated. Air travelers in Canada who require assistance to fly have in the past had no choice but to pay the extra fare for an attendant or an extra seat. That's about to change. The National Transportation Agency has decided that it is an undue obstacle to the mobility of disabled persons to require payment for an extra fare. The agency has applied to the Governor and Council to have the extra charges abolished. The policy will bring air travel in line with National Rail and Marine Services which do not require a payment for the extra fare. A court in Ontario has ruled that a 13-year-old girl with cerebral palsy must be allowed to compete in bowling tournaments. Tammy McLeod of Strathroy uses a special ramp to roll the ball down the lane. Youth Bowling Council of Ontario had tried to prevent Tammy from competing. The council had claimed the girl's use of the ramp gave her an unfair advantage. 
However, the court ruled that the ramp was nothing more than reasonable accommodation. In his decision, Justice Dennis Lane said the ramp offers her no advantage over her competitors. And that's this week's roundup of disability news. Coming up next, access to colleges and universities. Earlier in the news, there was a report on a conference of disabled college and university students in Halifax. In a few minutes, we'll talk with one student who took part in that conference. To set the scene, not an uncommon scene we're told, we'll look at an access problem faced by one disabled student. At York University, north of Toronto, a sign proclaims their campus to be wheelchair accessible. Joanne Desette, for one, is not impressed. Elevator. This freight elevator is the only way to set who cannot use stairs and two other students with disabilities can reach the third floor of the fine arts building. We are told that using freight elevators is a common experience for university and college students across Canada. Doucette says York thought it was doing her and the three other students a favor by allowing them to break the regulations and use the freight elevator. Not only is the elevator meant to be used for freight only, but Doucette says it is dirty and unsafe for people with mobility problems. First three weeks of class, this was literally full of garbage. There was rotting, you remember rotting tomatoes on the floor in a bag? There was, there was glass and there was broken wood. Doucette says university authorities are making all the right noises about accessibility and accommodation, but she feels they are not really listening. York sent its lawyer to give the university's position. For Harriet Lewis, it appears that it all comes down to numbers, the low number of disabled students at York. Now, I should say that in the Fine Arts Department, to the best of my knowledge, there are three people who have mobility impairments. Uh, and on the whole campus, there are 56 people that I know of. Now, this means that these are people who come to our Centre for Persons with Disabilities and identify themselves and ask for assistance. So, uh, in a 40,000 student population, there are few in the Fine Arts Department who have need of uh, assistance, so we look into accommodating them. I asked, what does York University say about the complaint by the three students and others that the freight elevator in the Fine Arts Building is a safety hazard and should be replaced by a proper elevator? Elevating Devices Branch has, at the request of Ms. Doucette, come and examine the elevator and they found that it is in good working order and that there is no problem with the elevator itself. It's not an unsafe ele elevator. I was leaning on my crutch. My crutch went down, my, rather my cane went down there because this door was up so there's a big hole, right? And so I went flying. I'm just glad my crutch didn't go down there. Apparently, what York didn't know was that Joanne Doucette is an experienced disabled rights activist. They were not happy when she took her complaint to the media, but York remains unmoved. It would like to help, but there just isn't enough money. The money will have to come out of our normal operating budget, our renovations budget likely, and we, we had allocated, I think it was 115000 for this fiscal year, which ends April 1st, which we've spent, I mean, we allocated it for retrofitting the campus to be more accessible. And starting April 1st, I suppose we'll have another similar amount of money and, and we'll have to decide what the priorities will be. And right now, York University's first priority is capital expenditures, expanding the physical plant. This means a new academic center and a new shopping mall for staff and students. A proper passenger elevator in the Fine Arts Building for Doucette and her two student colleagues can wait. Pull it down like this. It's very heavy and it hurts because I have problems with my shoulders as well as my knees. Bye, folks. Joining us now from Ottawa is Kalinda Joseph. Joseph is president of NEEDS, the National Educational Association of Disabled Students. The association has just concluded a national conference in Halifax. She uses a wheelchair. 
Ms. Joseph, we've just seen how a student at York University is having great difficulty reaching her classroom. How typical is this situation at universities and colleges across Canada? It's not unfamiliar at all. Um, for example, uh, Algonquin College here in Ottawa has an elevator at one of its campuses that is continually being ridden by able-bodied students. And students with disabilities are always asking them to get off the elevator, but they will not move. So students are showing up late, late to class. And, uh, and the students are being very bold. And, and these are, are students who are supposed to be learning about, um, about attitudes. And you wouldn't expect that from post-secondary institutions, college or university. And, so, you know, the, we've dealt with administration and trying to, to fix this problem and trying to install a key system, and they're a little bit reluctant about that. So, and it, that's minor when you compare it to, to trying to install a freight uh, or a passenger elevator, but the question of funding is always the biggest problem, and that's always the, the excuse or the problem that is, is brought up, and it's always, always, always the answer on behalf of administration. It's not unusual at all. How are the attitudes of some administrations out there changing as a result of your group's work? Uh, all we can say is, is uh, we have to go on what the students are telling us and, uh, and what the, uh, the coordinators for the disabled are telling us. And uh, it depends, again, on where you're talking about. Some are pretty good and s some are, are not good at all and, and unwilling to cooperate. But a change overall is, is, seems to be happening and seems to be looking at changing and, and making things more accessible. The problem you fall into though is, is when you talk about accessibility, a lot of people talk about wheelchair access more than anything else and they don't realize that there are many other disabilities out there including visual impairments and hearing impairment and learning disabled students and you also have to provide access to them and if you have a ramp in your school it doesn't mean you're accessible at all. It just means that somebody in a wheelchair can get into the building. Because the students are becoming more uh, aware of of the rights that they do have on campus and the fact that uh, they feel more confident now when they go and speak to a professor or to staff members and say, you know, I may need a certain am amount of time to write an exam, I may need extra amount of time to get to class because the building's a little bit inaccessible or I can't get on the elevator because students are hogging it. So the, the uh, staff is getting a lot better, which is nice to see, and I think they feel comfortable in that respect. It's still the problem still stems though from above the professors is, and that's where the problems have to change and that's where the attitudes have to change. Could you gauge the mood of students with disabilities across the country for us as a result of the conference? Very positive. Uh, a lot of students wanting to go to post-secondary institutions and wanting to go to colleges and universities which is a positive light and also wanting to form their own group as, groups on campus so that they could uh, could rally for or at administration talk to them about the problems that they may be having on campus and uh, it was really positive to see that. Ms. Joseph, thank you very much. You're welcome. Joe, Harriet Lewis, the lawyer from York University, mentioned the fact there were few students with disabilities at York, implying that access was not a high priority. That reminds me of a story I heard recently. An employer was asked why he hadn't installed a ramp at his workplace and his answer was he hadn't seen any disabled people working there. So why install a ramp? It brings a question to mind, Susan. Which comes first, the employees or the access? Coming up next, the hidden costs of disability. Joe, I'd like you and the viewers to take a look at this. I've got a bicycle tire and I've got an inner tube and that tire costs $749 and the inner tube is $329. That's a total of $1078. Well, interestingly enough, Susan, I have a wheelchair tire here and an inner tube. <laughs> Same kind of stuff, rubber. Uh, the wheelchair tire is $33 and the inner tube is $12, so that's a total of $45, almost four times as expensive as your bicycle tire. You're there. kidding. Yeah. Which brings us to a recent tour of the Eaton Center that I took with disabled advocate Vic Willie. Our trip to Eaton Center in downtown Toronto was prompted by something Vic Willie told me. Few people, he said, know about the hidden cost of disability. He says hidden costs affect everything from computer software to dogs. A lot of people, dogs are pets, but uh, to people with disabilities, dogs are sometimes the only way that they can achieve a decent level of independence. Uh, for instance, if you're a blind, 
a guide dog costs six thousand dollars now that cost isn't borne by the individual the cost of maintaining that dog in good health which is critical is about uh, two hundred dollars a month and their food the food in vet bills can be very high um, other people use uh, dogs called canine companions for instance a person who's deaf may use a dog to tell them that somebody's knocking at the door or the telephone's ringing they'll jump up or alternatively someone like myself in a wheelchair you can use a dog to pick up items off the floor. These dogs are very highly trained, they're extremely valuable, they know 87 commands, and uh, they have to be kept, again, at a very high level of health and, uh, and well maintained. This is a, a cost that is borne directly by the individual out of their pocket. Willie says the advent of miniaturization of electronics has been a real boon to people with disabilities. They provide them with a freedom they never had before. Uh, there are now flashing lights that fit on telephones for people who are deaf. There are TDDs that will uh, uh, convert uh, telephone conversations into print. There are flashing lights for door barrels, barrels. There are all kinds of marvelous devices for interfacing with computers and things like that. The cost of these devices are very, uh, very high right now. And uh, the majority of them are not covered by either ADP, the Assistive Devices Program, or if they are, they're covered only up to about 75 or 80 percent. You have to pick up the rest yourself. Then there is the cost of drugs, something all disabled people are so familiar with. It is, says Willie, a very complicated situation. One example is people on family benefits, for instance, are restricted to a schedule of drugs that family benefits will cover. Very often, however, pharmacists or, or doctors will prescribe certain drugs, which the individual needs, but they're not on the schedule. Now, the, you have two choices. You can either throw the prescription away or you can get the drug, and as most often is done, and, and pay the extra money directly out of your small pension. Uh, another thing is you can ask your doctor to prescribe a uh, over-the-counter drug. Then your choice is all you have to do is pay the extra prescribing cost. That cost is borne by the public, but that is a hidden cost within the area of drugs. Uh, many people with disabilities also have to use a lot of over-the-counter drugs, such as acetaminophen, aspirin, these sorts of things. And they are not covered in their drug schedule, so they just pay them at their, as an out-of-pocket expense. In his job, as well as in his personal life, Vic Willie is continually reminded how expensive being disabled can be. The list is endless. Uh, some people, many people need special shoes. Uh, their feet tend to break down. They need special uh, cushions for the wheelchair that may cost three or four hundred dollars. Uh, uh, very esoteric kinds of things. Um, they may need uh, rubber on the bottoms of their shoes so they don't slip around on the foot plate. They need adjustments to the back of their clothes because pants are meant for standing, right? Not sitting. And uh, to, so to make the back higher, or Velcro on the back so sweaters don't ride up around the shoulders, these sorts of things. I personally feel it costs me a minimum of five to six thousand dollars and probably a lot more. And probably, that's probably at the low end of the scale. I mean, just for instance, last week I had a flat tire in my wheelchair, the small wheel in the front, forty-three dollars. Two weeks before that I had to replace the batteries, two hundred dollars. So no matter which way you turn, with a disability, um, you have to pay. Another one of my staff is uh, hard of hearing. She has to buy batteries for her hearing aid. She also needs a special telephone, uh, which can cost anywhere between three and one thousand dollars. You know, she wants to record messages like everyone else at home. Have you got any uh, hidden costs to your disability? Well, Joe? I can't use public transit, uh, so I've got to use a car, and my car keeps, you know, taking a lot of money out of my pocket every month. That's for sure. How about you? Actually, I've got to have a cleaning lady because my lungs are so bad at this point for dust and also the fact I can't get around. And it adds up too. It sure does. Next week we'll hear about a court challenge to the Income Tax Act that would even the playing field for people with disabilities. Coming up, four-wheel freedom. For people who use wheelchairs, transportation can be a major barrier to independence. Converted vans have been a popular solution, but now there are other options. Cliff Wolf wanted to put his daughter Elaine back in the driver's seat and designed a lift for four-wheel drive vehicles. For all the alternatives, the, this, this blazer and the lift my father designed to uh, go into it was the, uh, the, the ultimate choice. <laughs> 
So then uh, my father said about designing a lift that would get me into a blazer rather than having to drive a van for me to drive independently. It's very simple and it's fast. And it's, uh, that's what, what I wanted, is to be able to get in and out when I wanted and to go places when and where I wanted. And uh, it's, it's so convenient, I don't have to transfer from my chair. And, uh, and I'm just, when I go onto the lift, I, I uh, go directly behind the steering wheel and uh, I'm positioned comfortably and I can just drive from there. So uh, it's, it's the most convenient thing I've ever tried driving. You can drive it from the driver's seat for able-bodied people, just bolt the driver's seat into place. Uh, it has a con considerable modifications to the original design. We have a, a 43 function logic board in it now that does the uh, checks everything before any movement is made. We have an emergency exit, exit sequence that you can activate if required. If you're in an accident and the door won't open, the hydraulics will push open the door and actually take the door right off the hinges very concerned with the safety aspects of it and we have uh, looked at it fairly carefully and thought of everything we can think of to make sure it's good and safe. Um, usually I don't park on the street. If I do, I would park on a one-way street and uh, open the uh, lift onto the, directly onto the sidewalk. And uh, as it is, if I do have to, for some emergency, park on the street, um, it's usually wide enough that uh, cars go around me. And uh, there's, there's, I've never had a dangerous episode parking on the street. You have to buy the blazer yourself, and uh, the renovations can be paid for under certain programs. If you know of any interesting conversions, please write to us. And speaking of letters, we've got a couple this week, Joe, that uh, relate to our feature story. Yeah, this one's from Nancy Parsons from Lower Sackville in Nova Scotia. Good to hear from people down east. We have a computer student working with us for six weeks, and she is in a wheelchair. We are on the 10th floor, and the elevator stopped working when the fire alarm went off the other morning. Now we were lucky that two of the men who work early shifts carried her down, chair and all. The stairwells are steep and narrow, and it was a very difficult and slow process. More of the problems that the building code could fix? This is also an accessibility issue. Educating others is a big job. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Nancy. And this letter is from Miriam Lippman, who lives in Montreal. She's trying to attend McGill University. Uh, she writes to us that she made an appointment to speak to the director of the disabled student services there. And at uh, the conversation, she asked whether the building was accessible. Um, the woman explained to her that the office was in the building on the second floor and that there was no elevator, but that she would come down and meet the students on the first floor in an office that they had set up. Miriam says she was shocked, surprised, angry and humiliated to find out that this office was a closet that was shared by Health Service. She feels the attitude expressed by McGill and those that represent the university is, well, at least we have the service. McGill is settling for what isn't the very best they could provide. Thank you for your input. And you can write to us with any news you might have across the country at the Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. That's the Disability Network, CBC, Box 500, Station A, Toronto, M5W1E6. Or fax us at 975-5636. And that's our show. I'm Joe Coughlin. And I'm Susan Pettit. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>